afternoon, everybody. Uh, apologies for being just a little tardy. We wanted to make sure the president wrapped up before uh, we got started here. Um, I see Matt's notebook, but no Matt. So uh, uh, in that, why don't we uh, start with Daphne? Why don't you kick us off? Uh, thank you. We could start with Ukraine. Sure. Lincoln was due to meet your Mac today. What was discussed in the meeting? So I expect a readout will be going uh, shortly, but to just offer um, a, a little bit about what was discussed, uh, the secretary met with uh, Ukrainian presidential administration head Andrei Yermak uh, earlier today. They spoke about a number of issues, uh, including the upcoming Washington NATO summit and allies' intention to bring uh, Ukraine closer uh, to NATO membership and helping to strengthen Ukraine's ability to defend against Russian aggression. The two also discussed energy security and ongoing G7 efforts to enhance the resiliency of Ukraine's energy grid and energy systems. The secretary also congratulated um, uh, Mr. Yermak on his historic uh, support at the Global Peace Summit, as well as Ukraine's uh, tenacious and historic defense of its northern and eastern regions uh, against recent Russian uh, offensives. Uh, but as I said, I suspect we'll have a, a formal readout going shortly. Okay, and then Hungary's Orban today urged Zelensky in a visit to Kyiv to consider a ceasefire to accelerate an end to the war. This comes just before the NATO summit next week. Are you concerned that this shows a divide in NATO? So uh, first, let me just say, um, I will leave it to uh, our partners in Hungary to um, offer any context or clarity that they would like to uh, Mr. Orban's comments. Uh, we and uh, the NATO alliance have been clear that um, there really is only uh, one solution here, and that is uh, the Russian Federation simply uh, leaving uh, Ukrainian territory. Uh, we have long felt that uh, this is, uh, again, just another example of Russia being the aggressor and infringing on Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty, uh, throwing the UN Charter uh, by the wayside. Um, which is a different stance than what Orban seems to be laying out there. So are you concerned that this shows division? So again, I will leave it to uh, respective countries to speak to uh, their own uh, policies, but we have been clear with partners and allies across the board that uh, any country that um, has influence or has a, a role to play should play every effort in uh, ensuring that uh, Russia withdraws from Ukraine totally. Okay, and then there's reporting that the U.S. invited the foreign ministers of Israel and several several Arab countries to the NATO summit. Can you confirm that and who was invited? Uh, I expect that there will be uh, additional guests uh, from countries that are uh, not uh, members of the NATO alliance, but I will, uh, I'm not going to get ahead of the summit. We'll uh, let us get to next week, and I imagine uh, across the interagency we'll have more to say about uh, next week's activities. Can you say if Israel is one of these? Again, I'm just not going to uh, speak to to, uh, specific participation uh, yet. Uh, like I said, I expect there will be attendance from other countries uh, not uh, fully in the NATO alliance, but uh, I don't have a specific roster to announce today. Thank you. Um, Matt, coming back well, to you. Well, yeah, let, let the record show I was actually here. I know, I and said. Then, I said and, then, I, and then and I, then we were told you were going to be late, so I went to make, to make a quick phone call. I was just waiting for our president to wrap yes, up. Yes, and then so. you, and yes, and yeah. then you denigrated me by saying all I said that was, I wasn't here. All I said was that your notebook was well, here, and I, you what, were not. What, <laughs> hardly a denigration, yeah, but okay. go ahead. All right, I understand. So yeah. anyway, uh, on the Middle East, yeah. and, and uh, as it relates to one, um, Gaza, but two Lebanon. So mm -hmm. one on Gaza. Um, is there any movement at all that you guys have seen uh, on this ceasefire proposal? And then two on uh, Lebanon. Uh, you know where where do things stand now? If they're any different than they were yesterday, and if they're not different than yesterday, then okay. Uh, on, on the second part, uh, they are not different from yesterday, but let me just, to the first part of your question, echo what the Secretary said at the Brookings Institution yesterday, is that we continue to be in intense effort with uh, our partners in Egypt, our partners in Qatar, to see uh, ways that we can close the gap that Hamas created and not saying yes to a proposal that everyone, including the United Nations, including the Israelis, uh, had said yes to. Uh, that is something that we are working around the clock, literally, as we 
we speak. Uh, and in the context of Israel's northern border, uh, as I said yesterday, restoring, restoring calm on the blue line continues to be uh, a priority. And we believe that a ceasefire in Gaza um, could bring about a calm to the conflict uh, in the north as well, uh, creating conditions for the displaced in both uh, Israel and Lebanon to return home. Uh, and that's something we're going to continue to work towards. Okay. So as it relates to Lebanon, you don't see anything over the last 24 hours that makes you more or less, or I don't know, is there anything that you see that makes you mm -hmm. more or less concerned about Matt, I have uh, seldom offered a, a, a specific analysis to, uh, to events like that. I, I will just leave it broadly again that this is an immense priority for this administration. We want to see calm uh, along the blue line. We believe that it needs to be a priority uh, for not just Lebanon, but also Israel. Uh, and this is something that we're continuing to work through. Could I Sean. follow up? I, I, I know he doesn't work in the building, but uh, Amos Hochstein uh, is in Paris, if not mistaken. Can you say anything about his, what he's there, what uh, what the U.S. is trying to do? I, I don't have any uh, updates as it relates to Mr. Hochstein's uh, travel. I'm, I'm sure my colleagues at the, the White House and the National Security Council uh, would be happy to, to offer um, any information. And we'll also okay. check with the team. We'll also check with the team to see if there's any uh, context to offer from this building. I'm sure, sure they would, Matt. Uh, maybe other people have other questions the Middle East have some things on other topics. Why don't I, we see if there is uh, sure. anything more on uh, the Middle East region, and then I'll come back to you. I, Camilla's had her hand up, so I, I, I promise I will get to you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for done sticking on Lebanon. Um, the New York Times is reporting that Israel's top generals want uh, a ceasefire to start as soon as possible um, without Hamas uh, having to be uh, eliminated, that Hamas could still remain in power. They want to do this in order to reportedly to get the hostages out, which is what some, is something that everybody wants. Do you have a comment on that at all? And obviously, this is no surprise, given that we've seen IDF spokespeople come out and say um, Hamas cannot be defeated. And, and where, where is, uh, is there anything that you can give us? So uh, I, I'm just not going to uh, uh, offer analysis on um, the, the back and forth in terms of uh, the negotiations and the assessments that might be ongoing as it relates to the ceasefire proposal. What I can say is that um, when President Biden laid this out a number of weeks ago, uh, we made clear that this three-phased uh, approach uh, that the UN Security Council endorsed, that Israel uh, uh, supported, is ultimately the best way to uh, end the violence in Gaza and ultimately end the conflict. We believe that it is the best path, best path to uh, ensuring all uh, the remaining hostages uh, can be released. We think it's the best path to ensuring that humanitarian aid uh, is able to get into Gaza. Uh, and so ultimately, Hamas has a choice here, and they have the opportunity to alleviate some of the suffering of the uh, Palestinian people. And so uh, what Echo so that, said yesterday is that um, the time for haggling is over and that there's a proposal that's on the table. So that, that main goal of getting a ceasefire does not require immediate defeat of Hamas. We have been pretty clear also that uh, we do not want to see Hamas uh, in charge of Gaza anymore. The secretary uh, was clear about this at the Brookings Institution yesterday. And uh, beyond that, it's something that he laid out uh, last fall when talking about certain principles that the United States views as uh, non-starters when we're talking about uh, the, the day after this conflict ends. And a key tenant of that, of course, is Gaza no longer being a springboard for terrorism against the Israeli people and Hamas no longer uh, being the governing authority there either. Okay, and just on Lebanon, just following up on that, there's absolutely no change in security posture for the embassy there, anything? I have no updates to offer. I will just use this opportunity to, to echo because you all know how much I lo love travel advisory warnings that uh, the travel advisory warning for the uh, entire country of Lebanon continues to be at a level three at reconsider travel and specifically the regions of uh, the border uh, bordering Israel as well as the borders in the north bordering Syria are at a level four of do not travel. Okay, and then um, on West Bank, uh, the Israel's far right finance minister, he agreed, this was end of last week, but he finally agreed to release funds for the Palestinian Authority. It was a tit for tat uh, exchange for legalizing or for Israel legalizing five Israeli settlements. Uh, do you have a comment on this kind of tit for tat engagement? Is that something that the US would tolerate 
moving forwards, if there's anything that should be belongs to the Palestinian Authority that should go to them, what's your comment on them saying we'll only do it if we legalize settlements? So first, um, uh, on the issue of correspondent banking, our view is that ultimately these are uh, these are uh, PA funds. These are funds that uh, belong to the Palestinian Authority. And so we, of course, welcome reports that Israel will extend uh, the correspondent banking relationship um, for four months and to release a portion of the PA's clearance revenues. But um, our call is for Israel to expand extend correspondent banking uh, for at least 12 months and to release, release the rest of the withheld clearance revenues as well. It's important to remember that the viability of the Palestinian Authority is essential to stability in the West Bank, which in turn is essential to Israel's own security interests uh, as well. We have made these concerns clear to uh, our partners at Israel at the highest level, and we'll continue to engage with them on this issue. Now, separately, um, it should come as no surprise to you that we view the uh, expansion of settlements as and outposts as inconsistent with international law. And again, we view these as something that uh, only serves to weaken Israel's uh, security. Uh, unilateral actions like settlement expansion and legalization of outposts, they are detrimental to a two-state solution. Um, so we'll continue to use the, the tools at our disposal to expose and promote uh, accountability for those who threaten peace and stability uh, in the region. Uh, go. Point. Sure. Let me. Tom wants it. I promise I'll get to you. Side. Go ahead. Um, I mean, just on this this uh, reported Smotrich deal, and you've said that you obviously see outposts as inconsistent with international law, but I'm just a bit confused because you know the reason these outposts are created by settlers is to one of the reasons is to draw in the Israeli military because they then are a protection force for those settlers that are there. So you say they're inconsistent with international law; they dis destabilizing but you are at the same time arming the military force that goes to protect the people that do it. I mean, isn't that a very confused policy? So we have a security relationship with uh, the government of Israel, Tom, that is no surprise to you or anybody um, in this uh, room. Let's also remember that Israel, when we talk about their security relationship and the threats they are facing, it is not simply just about the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, they have threats that they deal from uh, other malign actors in the region. Hezbollah in the north, Iran and other proxies uh, that uh, partake in destabilizing activities across the region. Now, when it comes to the provision of specific arms and articles, whether they are used in Gaza or the West Bank or used in other operations that our partners in Israel are conducting, there are clear protocols and policies in place, uh, as well as our continued engagement to ensure that uh, uh, security assets are, uh, when used, that their impact on civilians are minimized um, and that they are are used uh, in accordance to the way that the United States has provisioned them. Uh, that does not detract from our longstanding view that such kind of settlement activities is inconsistent with international law. And ultimately, uh, when we're talking about a more peaceful, more uh, stable region, it's a detraction from that as well. But I don't ask, I mean, I just ask not because these are sort of one-off incidents, but this is systemic. You know, outposts, and now they're being legalized by the finance minister as part of this apparent deal. Outposts are there, you know, one of the reasons that they exist is very specific. It draws in the military to Palestinian owned land that in many cases is a privately owned, this is privately owned Palestinian land that is taken uh, by settlers. So it's more than just inconsistent with international law. Uh, it, it would be seen by any objective observer as the theft of land. And the point I'm making is that you're arming the military force that goes in to protect the people that do that. So when it comes to the oversight of the security assets um, that we provide to any country, including Israel, there are, of course, accountability measures and uh, protocols in place to ensure that such um, uh, assets are used responsibly. And but they're not, those us, protocols are not obviously in place in this, for this particular, these particular actions because it's been going on for years and years. And now you have the Israeli government actually, as part of a deal, not to withhold you know, correspondent banking, which is... Tom, I, I stood, I stood behind this podium. Yes, it's not. 
this is not these are not individual incidents this is something that Tom, I stood behind this podium uh, a, a number of months ago to talk about um, how this administration uh, uh, used the Leahy law to look into uh, the use of uh, American security assets in particular units that may or may not have been operating in the West Bank. So I, I don't want to get into a back and forth on the specific provision of arms because that's a level of technical detail that we're just not in a uh, place to get to. What I can say and reiterate again is that our security relationship with Israel is robust. It is uh, far greater than just the West Bank and Gaza, that there are real legitimate threats that Israel faces in the region. Uh, but when it comes to the provision of uh, American security articles, there are accountability measures in place uh, that the United States continues to have at its disposal to ensure that those articles are being res used responsibly and for its intent. But simultaneously, that is all. it is also true that it is our view that settlement activity and outposts are inconsistent with international law. But I'm, the point I'm making is you say that's your policy, but it's actually not your policy. It's something you're saying, but what you're actually doing is militarizing the force that allows those outposts it to It absolutely exist. is our policy, so, Tom, and we and, have taken and a number of legalized. steps. So these, many of these are on land. It, it absolutely is our policy, and over the course of this administration, uh, especially in the past few months, we have taken a number of steps to hold those accountable who we believe to be perpetuating violence and destabilizing actions uh, in the West Bank. So, now, wait, but uh, since you mentioned it, how, how is that Leahy review of the one unit? I don't have any uh, updates for you, Matt. So in other words, there hasn't been anything done? Uh, that's not true. That's not true at all. That's not true? When I stood behind this podium and they talked about it, They haven't been given I, a clean bill of health or given, uh, you know, given a, a, a that particular know, unit notice or that, that particular unit those uh, those uh, yeah. it continues to be under review but on that same and for day how long has Matt, that been please under don't review interrupt now? me Hold when what, it, that not, same day that how? same day I also talked about a number of other units in which consistent with the memorandum of understanding that we have with Israel we worked to uh, identify issues and remediate and rectify those problems uh, so the security relationship with those particular units uh, could persist the point that I'm making is that we have levers at our disposal. Okay. How long has it been since that, that, that's been under review? Yeah. It would, that one unit? It's, it, it would have been a number of weeks, and I don't have any a number of for weeks? You. Well, that could be like 52. That could be 100. It, it's not 52. I believe no, we last talked about this. No, I know, but it's more than a month. Sure. I don't Definitely have any updates for you. Month. The point that I'm making, Matt, okay. is that... So where's the accountability, then? We have a number of tools at our disposal, and you have mm -hmm. seen this administration utilize them when it comes to okay. what, the, we're just, the, so the government So what of have you utilized? What, what tool have you utilized so far, other than the... 2,000 pound bombs, the suspension. We what just else? were talking about how we used Leahy vetting, uh, but beyond that, there continue to be other use, processes. You haven't used Leahy vetting. You haven't, you haven't suspended Because anything. consistent with Leahy vetting is identifying okay. uh, paths to so, remediation so and rectifying what other that problem. What other accountability measures have you used the, other than the, the, the one the small point that I, shipment the, of, of, of weapons that has been held up? Matt, what, what I said was okay. that there are there are uh, levers at our disposal, and we have spent okay. a number of times they? talking about them. The Churg process is an example. The, the Leahy what? process, the Churg, yes. don't act okay. confused. We yes. have talked no, about no, the Churg no. process yes. a number okay. of times. And the Leahy process. The Leahy, and process. the Leahy process has resulted in what? Matt. So far. The point of the Leahy process and consistent and with Churg our process. memorandum what has, of understanding. What has been the result of that so far? Consistent with the memorandum of understanding that we have with Israel, we had worked to rectify and remediate those problems. I was the point to Tom's question was I was answering was that we have tools at our disposal for the responsible use of their security assets. That does not detract from our long-held belief that settlements and outpost activity are inconsistent. With I think law. I think Vedant, the problem is is that 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 what he's raising and what a lot of other people are raising is that yes, you do have these levers, but you're not using them. A lot. We're also not going to speak to active and ongoing deliberative processes from up here. Said, go ahead. Thank you. Before I go to Gaza, I just want to follow up on the West Bank, to Tom, uh, question on the settlement. Is there any evidence, do you have any, any evidence that the Israelis listen to what you say, you, your expression of displeasure with the settlement and so on, let alone heed your warnings and so on on the settlement? Has there been a shred of evidence over the past so many months 
Now, you've spoken against the settlement and, 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 and the spread of settlement. Do you have any evidence that they actually said, okay, now we better stop I, because the United States is getting angry? I'm not going to speak to private diplomatic conversations, Saeed, but over the course of this conflict, when we have raised things with our partners in Israel, they have uh, heeded our feedback, and I'm not going to uh, parse it more specifically than uh, but, that. But this is actually, I mean, the, 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 that's a physical thing that you can point to. Has there been any sort of, you know, uh, tearing down a settlement, backing off uh, plans to increase housing, you know, by you know, so many folds and so on. Has there been any evidence so like, I, as just, a result of your warning time and time again and telling them that this is a violation of international law? I, I'm not going to speak to uh, our diplomatic conversations more specifically, uh, but it uh, it's our hope that Israel is also interested in uh, preserving and maintaining its own uh, security in the region. And that's why we have been so clear that such kind of activities are not just inconsistent with international law, but a detraction from uh, Israel's security as well. On Gaza, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, now, the Israelis uh, ordered new Khan Yunus uh, evacuation. And, uh, you know, we heard the, the Secretary of State say yesterday that there's no sign that Israel is really, you know, lowering the intensity of its attacks on uh, Gaza. And we also hear of uh, looming starvation in Gaza. I mean, this is really a very horrific situation. Are you guys sort of reconciled, uh, this is the order of the day, things will go on like this indefinitely. I mean, do you, have, do you have any kind of vision how this thing is going to end? When will it end? What is so, the United States of America doing about it? Said, let me uh, say a couple things because I spoke a little bit uh, about this yesterday. I know yeah, you were out yesterday, but um, yeah. first, as it relates to um, uh, the activities in Khan Yunus, uh, our viewpoint continues to be that any kind of forced displacement or forced relocation of Palestinians, uh, of course, would be inconsistent with what uh, the United States uh, wants for the region and inconsistent with the principles that the secretary laid out. That being said, it is, of course, uh, Israel and the IDF has a right to defend itself from terrorism in accordance with international law. And as it is conducting these operations, it is uh, fully appropriate them uh, for them to warn and encourage evacuation of civilians from potential areas where they may or may not be conducting operations. Uh, but specifically in, in Khan Yunus, we have seen Hamas moving back uh, into areas previously cleared by uh, the Israeli military. Uh, and yet just yesterday, we understand that uh, Hamas fired 20 rockets at Israel from uh, the East Khan Yunus region yesterday. Of course, how these operations are conducted uh, matters, uh, and Israel needs to take every feasible uh, precaution to protect civilians uh, in their operation. But more importantly, Said, to your point about when will this end and where when will this conflict. And let's not forget, uh, and I think too often in this room, we tend to find ourselves forgetting that just a number of weeks ago, the president laid out uh, the tenants of a ceasefire proposal that would bring the hostages home, that would allow for an influx of humanitarian aid, that would put us on a path to uh, diplomacy for the region, to get us to a region that is more in integrated, more secure, and more stable. And at every turn, what we have seen happen is Hamas has moved the goalposts, it has changed the parameters, it has come back um, asking for different things, even though it had previously approved various iterations of this proposal before. Let's not forget that this is a proposal that uh, Israel had accepted, that the United Nations had accepted, that partners in the Arab world had accepted, um, and that, of course, as I said, it's something that the United States was pushing for as well. So if there's an interest in seeing this conflict end, if there's an interest in bringing about some sort of relief for the Palestinian people, the, the solution is quite simple. Uh, Hamas can stop haggling and they could accept the ceasefire proposal that has been on the table. But they, you know, I mean, can you tell us that uh, with certainty that they, that Israel accepts this? this Israel I mean, itself have we, have we said. Heard the the Prime Said, Minister of Israel, Said, say, Israel itself said that it accepted the proposal that the president did, laid did out. The, did the Prime Minister say that himself? They did. Did he say that the, I accept the, this this proposal as submitted and and approved at the Security Council at the United Nations? Said, I uh, I'm happy to help you look at okay. Google uh, oh. after this and look up who in the Israeli government did or did not say okay. things yeah, as it relates like to the one, one, one last But question. I just want to be very clear that this is a proposal that Israel itself has said that they uh, supported. All right. Go ahead. Uh, let me ask you one last question on wounded Palestinians telling the BBC 
more wounded Palestinian uh, telling the BBC that they have been held as human shields and so on. Are you aware of these reports and do you have any comment on that? Sorry, could you be a little bit more specific about what you're referring well, there to? Well, were, there were reports by the BBC that more Palestinians, I mean, we saw this, I guess, 10 days ago and so on, when the Israelis strapped a wounded Palestinian in the front of a jeep. Now, it seems that this is basically was used time and time and time again. I was wondering if you are aware of these reports and if you have any comments. So on, on the specific practice. reports side, uh, yeah. we have seen those disturbing reports in the video. Um, the Israeli military and the IDF itself said that it was investigating uh, the incident and that what was portrayed in those videos did not reflect its values and uh, was a clear violation of its orders and procedures. I will let them um, speak to that, uh, but we uh, call again Israel uh, to swiftly investigate and ensure accountability uh, for any abuses and and violations. Uh, and we'll continue to make clear to the government of Israel uh, that uh, there are, of course, uh, expectations uh, to behave consistent with uh, the law of armed conflict. Right. Thank you. Michelle, yeah, go ahead. A couple of questions, sure. if you don't mind. Uh, first, uh, is the U.S. coordinating with uh, Germany in its efforts to find a diplomatic solution uh, for the war between Israel and Hezbollah? And are you aware of uh, a visit that a, a German intelligence uh, official made to Beirut and met with Hezbollah officials. So I would just, uh, I would let the government of Germany uh, speak to their own uh, efforts in the region. What I can say is that uh, Germany is one of our closest uh, partners uh, in a number of areas, not just when it comes to the Middle East, but also Ukraine as well. And uh, I have no doubt that um, uh, they are eager to play a uh, positive and uh, contributive role uh, in addressing this conflict and not just uh, finding a uh, peaceful resolution to the conflict in Gaza, but also uh, ensuring that uh, there is calm uh, along the blue line as well. But I will let them speak to uh, their own efforts. Uh, uh, on uh, Syria and Turkey, do you have any comments on uh, the clashes between Turks and Syrians inside Turkey and in northern Syria uh, that killed uh, seven people yesterday. We have um, urged our, our partners in the government of Turkey to coordinate with both Iraqi and uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq authorities on any cross-border military operations to protect civilians from harm. Uh, we certainly recognize the ongoing threat posed by the PKK, but we also urge the Turkish government to respect Iraqi sovereignty and to coordinate these kinds of military operations. But the clashes uh, weren't uh, about uh, the PKK because uh, um, Syrians in Turkey got attacked by Turks and they demonstrated yesterday in northern Syria and attacked uh, uh, Turkish uh, troops who are based in uh, northern Syria. I'm happy to look a little bit more specifically into this um, uh, incident, uh, Michelle, but I would just say unequivocally that uh, in any kind of um, activity or operation that efforts need to be made to protect civilians. And uh, do, you do you support uh, a meeting or a reconciliation between S Syria and Turkey, especially that uh, officials from the two countries will meet soon in uh, Iraq. So I've seen those reports, Michelle, and our position um, has been clear. Uh, we will not normalize relations with the Assad regime uh, absent authentic progress toward a political solution to the uh, underlying conflict. Uh, we've been clear with regional partners, including Turkey, that engaging with the Syrian regime, um, that credible steps uh, to improve the humanitarian condition, human rights, uh, and the security situation for all Syrians needs to be at the focus uh, for these kinds of engagements. And we've also stressed with regional partners that uh, the Syrian regime uh, needs to cooperate in the political process that is laid out in UN Security Council Resolution 2254. My last question yeah. on Iran. Uh, Iran is expediting its nuclear program, and they are more open now about uh, declaring that they need the, the nuclear uh, bomb uh, based on the last round of missiles with Israel. Uh, what's your comment on that? On that? So l since the onset of this administration, the uh, President Biden, Secretary Blinken have been clear that um, uh, Iran will uh, not be able to uh, obtain a, a nuclear weapon. Um, and so that continues to be our goal and focus. I don't have any uh, updates to offer beyond that. Uh, Sean, sure. uh, switch topics uh, to. Can I just see if there's anything sure. else on on the region before I come back to Sean? Go ahead, yeah, Dr. Just uh, going back to the cross border operation between yep. Turkey. Is that something that you concern about this operation? Because Turkey has set up 
the checkpoints is in Kurdistan region and they are taking IDs from the civilians people there. And this is a big concern for the people living in that region. Is this is this something uh, Look, in, 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 in any region of the world, when we see um, civilians placed uh, in, uh, in in risk, it is, of course, uh, something of concern to us. That's why we're uh, in making sure to engage closely with our partners uh, in Turkey to make clear that uh, when such kind of uh, strikes are being undertaken, that they need to be coordinated with authorities in the Kurdistan region as well as uh, Iraq. Uh, however, there are, as I said, legitimate concerns from the PKK, uh, and we understand those. But uh, we continue to call for greater coordination to ensure that civilians are protected from harm. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, Maduro yesterday said that, in his terms, that negotiations are resuming uh, Wednesday, which tomorrow, uh, with the United States. Uh, to begin with, can you can you confirm that there's dialogue that's going to take place with Venezuela? Obviously, from his perspective, he's looking for sanctions relief ahead of the elections. Can you say if that's something on the cards? So um, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of our diplomatic engagements beyond just saying that uh, in the context of Venezuela, you've heard us say this before, we, uh, of course, welcome dialogue in good faith, and we support the Venezuelan people's desire for competitive and inclusive elections on July 28th. And we are clear-eyed that uh, democratic change will not be easy and certainly uh, requires a serious commitment. We're going to continue to work with the international community and democratic actors in Venezuela to support the aspirations of the Venezuelan people. I will also just add that uh, in our viewpoint, uh, it continues to be the case that the full implementation of the Barbados Agreement offers the best path to restore the democracy that Venezuelans deserve, improve economic and humanitarian conditions, as well as uh, address the migration crisis as well. Sir Sander, welcome dialogue in good faith. I mean, can you say that if, if that's, is that what you expect to happen with, with Venezuela? Uh, that's uh, like a, that's what our uh, would be the intent, but I, I, I'm certainly not going to get ahead of the process. And I mean, is this, uh, I mean, in, in terms of what, what the Venezuelans, the, the Venezuelan authorities can expect from this, I mean, is sanctions really actually on the cards? Is this something that, you know, we, we're a month ahead of the election? Is this something that could be on the cards in the coming month? Well, I, I, I'm certainly not going to try and get into the uh, head of, of Mr. Maduro and try to stay out of the minds of uh, other uh, uh, world officials. But it, look, the, the, you, you heard me say this, that the full implementation of the Barbados Agreement uh, we think is the best, best path to restore democracy that uh, Venezuelans deserve. It's also the best path to improve economic and humanitarian conditions and address the migration crisis. So this is something that we'll continue to uh, focus on. We uh, will engage in dialogue with uh, uh, with a broad range of Venezuelan actors. And, and just finally, I mean, you, you, you said that they're the broad range, but how does this uh, relate to um, to the uh, the democratic opposition in Venezuela? I mean, is there, are they going to be part of this uh, conversation with Maduro? So we continue, the, engaging with the democratic actors in Venezuela continues to be a, a part of our engagement as well. Uh, and as you know, we engage with a broad uh, dialogue and a broad range of voices in Venezuela, and that is going to continue to be the case. We'll maintain maintain regular and ongoing uh, engagement with the representatives of the democratic opposition um, and our diplomatic partners as well. Okay, just uh, two separate topics yeah. in mind. Um, state in the region, Cuba. Uh -huh. uh, did you see the CSS, CSIS report on espionage uh, allegedly by China being wrapped up in Cuba? The Cuban government isn't very happy about this. Um, do, do you have anything to say about whether this is something that the United States has also seen, if it's seen a greater uh, uh, risk of espionage? So I'm not going to comment on uh, or confirm or get into the specifics of, uh, of that report. But what I can say is that um, we remain confident that the United States is going to be able to meet our security commitments at home and in the region. Uh, we talked about this a little bit a year ago. Um, uh, PRC activities uh, in Cuba have been going on for decades, and the PRC, uh, we know that the PRC is going to keep trying to enhance its presence in Cuba, and the United States is going to keep working to disrupt it. And uh, this is a space that we are closely monitoring, and we'll take appropriate steps to, mo uh, to counter it when necessary. To disrupt it, that by what means? Again, I'm not going to I'm not going to get specific on that from here, but we uh, uh, this is something we're continuing to monitor, and we'll take steps to counter it should we need uh, to. And, and just 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 briefly, I mean, yeah. this, this might be an obvious question to U.S. government officials, but but what, what is the risk of, uh, of 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 Chinese operations there? I mean, the the United States obviously has espionage uh, 
you know, as, as, as surveillance operations around the world. Is there a specific threat that you see from, from a Chinese presence in Cuba? I, obviously, we certainly would not uh, want um, a, a, a country like the PRC um, uh, conducting such an operation uh, in, uh, in such a region that is, uh, has proximity to the United States. Uh, I'm not going to speak to it more uh, specifically than that. Uh, and this is something, like I said, that we'll continue to uh, monitor and work to disrupt as well. If you don't mind, oh, do you want to follow on that? I just had one quick sure. question on that. Yeah. Is there any, can you share with us that the actions that the U.S. government has taken to date have been effective in disrupting any of that uh, Chinese activity in Cuba? I just wouldn't speak to something like that from uh, up here, given uh, security and intelligence concerns. But the report but what I can out say shows is expanding um, uh, spying facilities there in Cuba. So it's just, it raises questions about how effective you guys have been. So uh, uh, what I can say and what I said at the uh, onset of Sean's question is that we continue to be confident in our ability to meet our security commitments and responsibilities uh, both here at home and in the region. This is a space that we're continuing to monitor and watch and we will take appropriate steps uh, to counter it. Uh, the PRC has long been trying to enhance their presence in Cuba and we are continuing to work to disrupt it, but I'm not gonna speak more uh, specifically to the issue uh, than that. Gita, go right, ahead. Thank you. Um, the Global Times is a China Communist Party affiliated uh, media outlet. It was uh, designated by the U.S. government four years ago as a foreign mission. Now, recently, uh, this outlet has been uh, attacking a well-respected uh, China scholar for her research on China trying to distort the UN uh, Resolution 2758 to embed its one China policy. I was wondering if the State Department is aware of this action of what the Global Times is doing, and if so, what are you doing? So, Gita, uh, combating transnational repression is a priority uh, component of U.S. efforts to counter rising authoritarianism and defend human rights around the world. Our viewpoint is that any academic, any scholar, any journalist, any person, uh, they certainly need to be, uh, uh, any kind of harassment towards them is uh, unacceptable. Everyone has a right uh, to express their point of view uh, in the United States. Freedom of speech and peaceful assembly are legally enshrined in our constitution. Um, go ahead, Jackson. Thanks, Madame. The German newspaper Bild uh, reported Israel could invade Lebanon this month. Will Israel uh, forewarn the U.S. of such action? Do renewed travel warnings for Americans to avoid Lebanon have anything to do with the impending Israeli operation in Lebanon? So uh, on travel warnings, we uh, regularly update and uh, assess those based on situations on the ground. We have a responsibility to inform American citizens and we'll continue to do so um, as circumstances on the ground change. I spoke a little bit this to uh, Camilla's uh, question. The travel warning for Lebanon as a whole continues to be a level three with a level four specifically for Southern Lebanon um, and the border uh, near Syria as well. Uh, we also have a close uh, working relationship with our uh, partners in Israel, and we continue to be in touch with them about our expectation for uh, calm along the blue line as well. And is there any consideration of plans for the U.S. and NATO to enforce a no-fly zone in parts of Ukraine? Uh, I have no, nothing to update uh, on that right now. Thank Alex, you. go ahead, and then I'll come to you, Kylie. Thank you. A couple of topics. Uh, well, so go back to your uh, conversation. Uh, your answers to Daphne's question about Yermak meeting was a caveat that there's still you know, uh, a result coming up. But um, I was wondering if the secretary came out of that meeting with better sense of Ukraine's current urgent mm -hmm. needs. We have heard, you know, uh, renewed calls for uh, long range, uh, you know, uh, 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 weapons. And uh, of course, lifting all the restrictions that Ukraine thinks that all the help are helping Russia to save its air bases. So, Alex, um, I, I, let me just say that uh, the United States and Secretary Blinken, of course, we are unequivocally um, paying close attention to uh, what are Ukraine's needs. In addition to, of course, um, uh, uh, Mr. Yermak, uh, we remain in touch with a number of uh, officials in the Ukrainian government as well as they continue to defend their, um, uh, their sovereignty and territorial integrity against Russia. The Secretary of Defense talked uh, a little 
little bit about it this morning in, uh, in his bilateral engagements. The United States is uh, continuing to work on an additional uh, security assistance package. I expect we'll have uh, more to say on that uh, forthcoming, uh, but we are acutely aware about uh, what yeah, Ukraine's uh, needs are, and we're continuing to work hand in hand with them to ensure that they have what they need for their defense. Thank you. And or one question. Um, please help us understand what the uh, department is thinking about what the worst stage currently today looks like when you have Orban is out there trying to save and make Ukraine, make uh, Europe great again. And we have Russia, a uh, terrorist state, leading U.S. U.S. Security Council. So let, let me just say that uh, if you're talking about Prime Minister Orban's specific visit to uh, Ukraine, I, I will let uh, his office uh, speak specifically uh, about his travels. But uh, this, in our point of view, is an example of uh, our European allies increasing their support uh, for Ukraine uh, because there is a collective recognition that Ukraine's fight to defend its people and its independence is part of a larger fight for democracy and international stability. And what we are seeing in Ukraine is not just uh, a threat to Ukraine. It is a broader threat to European security. So uh, this is something that Secretary Blinken has recently emphasized, uh, and so we'll continue to engage with partners in the region uh, as well. Kyla, uh, on Russia's, uh, Russia's uh, I'm gonna, UN, UN Security Council uh, uh, you know, uh, chairmanship, any comment on that? Uh, not really. Uh, we wish them the best of luck. I have one more question. I'll, come back to me later. I'll just on a different topic yeah. um, that we discussed briefly yesterday at the Doha conference. Yeah. Um, were the case of the two Americans who were detained in Afghanistan raised during that conference by Tom West? They were. So during uh, these meetings, uh, Special Rep West pressed for the immediate and unconditional release of, uh, of U.S. citizens unjustly detained in Afghanistan, noting that these detentions impede, impede progress uh, in the Taliban's own uh, desire for uh, international uh, recognition. U.S. officials continue to press for their release con continuously and at every opportunity. And did you, did the department walk away feeling like there was any forward movement on those efforts or it was just raised? Uh, it was just raised. I have no updates to offer from up here. And what's the latest, if any, contact with those two Americans that you can share? Uh, I don't have any uh, updates in terms of contact or any kind of uh, consular access that obviously would be a little unique given the Taliban. Here's a question was it raised directly with the Taliban? It was. So like a private, this, a private meeting? Correct. So uh, to, to widen the aperture a little bit, Special Representative uh, Tom West and Special Envoy um, uh, Amiri met directly with uh, Taliban representatives during the Doha 3 meetings. Um, talk, go ahead. The so, is visiting Kazakhstan right now. Uh, he will meet President Putin of Russia again tomorrow. So what is your expectation for the meeting? If China does not stop supporting Russia's war effort in Ukraine, what will happen? So no country should offer uh, Putin a platform to promote his uh, war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, it cannot be business as usual uh, with Russia, and no country should turn a blind eye to the clear violations of international law that Russia has committed. And we strongly support um, uh, efforts that have been undertaken by us uh, and our partners in the G7 uh, in addressing uh, what we are seeing as a reconstitution of Russia's uh, defense uh, industrial base. We believe that the PRC's reconstitution uh, is deeply problematic, and uh, we're going to continue to monitor this and take appropriate actions independently, as well as through multilateral uh, institutions uh, as well. And, and you heard me talk about this a little bit before, but this kind of reconstitution, again, is not just a threat to Ukraine, it's a threat to your Euro uh, European security um, as well. How about one more? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, a mayor of a small town in the Philippines uh -huh. is accused of being a Chinese asset or a Chinese agent, I mean agent. So according to the media reports, the fingerprint of the, uh, the mayor and the Chinese national is identical. Do you have any comment on the news story? Are you concerned that may increased tension in the South China Sea? Uh, I don't. Um, I would defer to uh, authorities in the, the Philippines to speak to anything about that. Yeah. Uh, China and the Philippines had talks uh, today, I believe it was, and there were some statements in there regarding de-escalate tensions. How, how significant is this from the U.S. perspective? How, how important do you see it? 
Look, we of course would welcome any efforts to uh, uh, nor, uh, de-escalate tensions in the South China Sea. It's something that's of course a, a priority for us. But uh, specifically in this context, I think uh, when it comes to the PRC, actions speak louder than words. Specifically uh, for our partners in the Philippines, when we're talking about uh, the Second Thomas Shoal and some of the destabilizing actions that uh, the PRC has taken in that region. Uh, we would welcome steps to de-escalate, but uh, actions speak louder than words. And clearly, uh, especially in the South China Sea, especially in the context of the Second Thomas Shoal, you have seen um, uh, PRC actions be inconsistent with uh, a stated goal, perhaps, of, of de-escalation. Um, go ahead in the back. Yeah, you, in the green oh, tie. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, so yeah, so Taiwan just said that China's Coast Guard has boarded and detained a Taiwanese fishing boat and calls for its release. Do you have a reaction? Uh, I've uh, not seen that report, so I'm happy to check with the team and see if we have some more updates on and, what happened. And, and, and um, so uh, U.S. and Chinese officials have been holding talks about cracking down on fent uh, fentanyl source in China. Uh, Blinken highlighted this at the Brookings Institute yesterday. President Biden said this during the debate that fentanyl is coming from Asian countries and they're cracking down hard on it. But the Bipartisan House Select Committee on the CCP released a report in April that said that the CCP is subsidizing the manufacturing and export of fentanyl precursors through tax incentives. Uh, have you raised this concern with those officials? When we're talking about fentanyl precursors, that continues to be something that we continue to raise in every engagement that we have with uh, officials in the PRC. Uh, progress and uh, the specific efforts in the working group that we have seen in recent weeks and months on fentanyl is something, uh, it's a product of President Biden and Secretary Blinken's engagement uh, at the historic Woodside Summit in November. Uh, I will also just note that we have, uh, since that summit, seen the PRC take some appropriate actions, including um, designating certain companies and uh, uh, enforcing some actions within their own justice system. That is, of course, a, a, a welcome step. Uh, but this is something that we're going to continue to work at with the PRC through these working groups and through other uh, channels uh, as well. Thank you. Alex, yeah, go ahead. On uh, tomorrow's meeting in Aslan, Bibi, Xi and Putin, you said that no country should offer Putin a platform. Um, does it apply to Turkey as well? Erdogan is also planning to meet with Putin tomorrow. In any any country, this is something that we uh, stress with uh, with with all of our partners. We continue to ask all of our partners that um, uh, they need they should uh, support efforts to realize an enduring and just peace for Ukraine, and for those that have influence or a relationship with Russia, to urge them to <coughs> withdraw uh, troops from Ukraine's uh, sovereign territory. Thank you. And finally, on uh, Armenia Azerbaijan, you guys have invited both countries to the NATO summit. I understand the preparations are still going on. Uh, to the extent that you can talk about it, is there any plan to bring them together while they're here? Uh, again, Alex, uh, let me just say broadly in the context of the issue in the South Caucasus, this is a priority for us, a priority for uh, the Secretary and other officials across this department. I have no doubt that uh, it's something we'll continue to work towards. Specific meetings and engagements on the margins of the summit, uh, I just don't want to speak to the schedule yet. Um, all right, hey, thanks, everyone. Go ahead. Sorry, I had to run out again. Everything okay? I Yes, everything is fine, but it's just had to, 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 but anyway, I, I'm not sure if this was raised uh, when I think it was Sean asked about this uh, report about uh, China and mm -hmm. Cuba. Your response to it, as far as I could tell while I was on the phone from watching it on TV, was that, uh, yeah, you're concerned about this kind of activity given the proximity of it to the U.S. Is that, is that essentially correct? Well, Sean posed the question of what uh, concerns could we have. I, I certainly I wasn't going to get into specific uh, intelligence concerns or no. I know, but you but, but but because because the, there is this Chinese activity going on in Cuba, that that was an issue, right? Did yeah. you say that or not? That that was the premise of the question. Yes. Okay. So if that is a concern and a legitimate concern for the United States. Why is it not a legitimate concern for China to be concerned about what you guys are doing with Taiwan? The Taiwan is, what, 100 miles off the coast of China and Cuba is 96, 97 miles off the coast of Florida? Matt, we have at, at never at any point have 
any country is allowed to have any uh, feelings that they uh, would like to have. Uh, and when it comes to activities that the U.S. may or may not be participating in, certainly we wouldn't speak to those from up here. The context, the question was asked about this specific report speaking about right. PRC efforts in Cuba, to which uh, I simply address that, one, uh, we have seen efforts by the PRC to expand their operation in uh, Cuba for uh, uh, some time now. We continue to have lines of effort in play to disrupt it. This is a space that we'll continue to monitor um, and uh, take appropriate action as necessary. Look, I'm not suggesting that your concerns are wrong about Cuba. I'm just wondering why they, why, why the Chinese can't have the same concerns about your your activity in, in Taiwan, which includes, uh, as far as I can tell, a lot more than what this report entails about uh, China. Matt, that's certainly not something that I would speak to from this podium, but I also think that uh, comparing uh, us as a country to the PRC as a country, it's a I'm little bit apples and oranges. I'm not trying to. Not, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. No, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say that, that, that if you have concerns, legitimate concerns about Chinese presence or you know activity in Cuba, why is it incompatible for the Chinese to have concerns about That's U.S. activity in Taiwan? That I would, it's just